Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Paul Baljong, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Government at Cornell University. You are attending, responding to the attack on the US Capitol, a virtual teach-in sponsored by the Junior Americanist Workshop Series. Um, this webinar will be recorded. So just that you're aware, we're also going to share this webinar on YouTube shortly after uh, we're finished. Last Wednesday, rioters supporting Donald Trump's attempts to overturn the 2020 presidential election stormed the US Capitol. The attack forced the evacuation and lockdown of the Capitol building and disrupted the counting of electoral votes to formalize Joe Biden's election victory. Those who participated in this insurrection threatened the safety of all who worked in the Capitol building, including members of Congress. These rioters also attacked the Capitol Police, damaged property, and looted. In this virtual teach-in, we will offer context to the events that happened on January 6th. Then we will discuss how we should respond to this assault on US democracy and the threats of white supremacy and right-wing extremism. Before we get started, let me introduce you to the members of the panel who are all distinguished researchers and educators. Jay Krombach is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Washington. His research focuses on the politics of race, business and labor, and political and economic inequality. Nathan Kelmo is an associate professor of political communication at Louisiana State University. His research focuses on political behavior and American political history. Sabrina Karim is an assistant professor of government at Cornell University. Her research focuses on political violence and police reform in a global context. Christina Kinane is an assistant professor of political science at Yale University. Her research focuses on the role of legislatures, executives, and the bureaucracy in policymaking. Brendan Nyhan is a professor of government at Dartmouth College. His work focuses on misconception, misperceptions and misinformation about politics and healthcare. Alyssa Richardson is an assistant professor of journalism at the University of Southern California. Her work focuses on how black activists use mobile phones and social media to produce innovative forms of journalism. Thank you all panelists for joining us tonight. We will begin with a short opening statement from each panelist. Then I will ask the panelists some questions and we'll have a discussion for about 30 minutes. Finally, we will answer questions from you, the audience. Please use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask your questions. Professor Krumbach, please take it away. Thanks so much, Bao Bao. Thanks for organizing this tremendously awesome team of panelists here and on this really critical issue uh, in American democracy. So I really appreciate your sort of organizing work here. So uh, I think I'd like to summarize this as saying, uh, this is, you can set your watch to something like this. Uh, this incident in the Capitol, this insurrection is like clockwork, the most American form of clockwork. Um, so conservative elites with a really unpopular economic agenda, especially in an era of massive inequality, face a dilemma, as Daniel Ziblatt argues, where they can choose to be part of the democratic process and take some losses, take some L's, as we would say, or they can choose to stoke racism, conspiratorial beliefs, and antipathy towards democracy and their political opponents. And with this sort of foundation in place, a very modest move towards interracial democracy, such as the electoral defeat of Donald Trump, is likely to provoke and really ignite a violent white supremacist backlash like we saw. So I really wanna say it's, it was actually quite clear that we could see this coming. And we couldn't just see this coming during the Trump era, we could see this coming earlier. We could see this coming in the 2010s and the Tea Party era and opposition to uh, Barack Obama and uh, a general uh, sort of interracial democracy during that time period with research from uh, people like Matt Barreto and uh, Chris Parker and others who talked about the sort of xenophobic and anti-immigrant uh, sort of uh, sentiments among the Tea Party. We could see this before in the 2008 campaign, not only with the birther movement that birthed sort of the political career of Donald Trump, but also with even with John McCain, a sort of principled establishment Republican who actually during the 2008 eight campaign stoked conspiratorial beliefs about mass voter fraud by people of color uh, with respect to the organization ACORN at the time. 
We could see this before in the Bush administration's norm violations in the earlier 2000s around the security state. We could see this before in the 1990s with conservative media and the sort of Newt Gingrich 1994 revolution. We could see this before in the 1980s and uh, Reagan's Southern strategy and before that Nixon's Southern strategy, which was to uh, uh, really move working class white voters to the Republican party through appeals to racism. We could see this with very serious sort of William F. Buckley style conservative opposition to civil rights earlier, which was based not only in racism, but also in a deeply anti-democratic theory. Um, we could see this in Jim Crow and Northern Jim Crow. And uh, most of all, we could see this in the demise of reconstruction um, in the late 19th century. So uh, in sort of uh, capturing all this, I think moving forward, we just, we must ask more of our civil society organizations and elites, especially groups like business, religious institutions, universities, and other mainstream institutions that get to decide whether to play ball with the long running sort of fascist and white supremacist interests in American society, or can help the rest of society sort of remove them from the political process as should have been done during reconstruction. Look forward to hearing everybody else's thoughts. Thank you. Professor Kelmo. Thanks, everybody. So why did it happen? Well, the answer depends on where you want to start in time. The immediate cause should focus on the president and many Republican leaders telling voters that the election was stolen, that they should resist by every means. The long story requires a dive into American history. Uh, thinking in terms of decades and centuries shows how the alignment between political parties and racial and religious identities has always been key to partisan conflict in our politics. When the party and other identities align, we have seen more violence. Our past is full of political violence by citizens against government, but the violence in the middle and late 1800s has the most similar similarities to what we're seeing today, though not on the same scale yet. The Civil War is the most extreme comparison the parties then were divided over black enslavement. And when Lincoln won the presidential election, white Southerners refused to accept the result and went on to kill 750,000 Americans in the rebellion. Party leaders told them to fight and they did. After the war, Confederates went largely unpunished. They continued to kill thousands of black Southerners in an effort to reestablish slavery and reinstate total white supremacy. With the parties aligned by race and political control at stake, that violence was racial and partisan. The 1876 presidential election was a disputed one after white Southerners killed and intimidated black voters, officials, and politicians. Congress ultimately chose the president then. In a compromise, he promised to end Reconstruction, which meant that democracy died in the region for over a century. In the mid 20th century, Northern Democrats began appealing to black voters who fled white terrorism in the South, splitting the party between white supremacists and racial liberals. In the 1960s, the racial liberals succeeded in taking over the party. The Republican Party quickly moved to win over white Southerners with racially coded racist appeals. And now white Southerners are mostly Republicans. So today, the Republican Party continues in the spirit of the Confederacy as the party most aligned with white power and in resisting democracy when they can no longer win elections. Since the 1980s, the party added Christian nationalism as well. The party has become an ethnic party, trying more desperately to keep power as Americans grow more diverse. So the details have changed, but the basic conflicts remain the same, and that's the long-term cause. Thanks. Thank you. Professor Kareem. Thank you, Bao Bao, and, and thanks for everybody to, uh, for being here. I think this is going to be a very fruitful discussion and hopefully one that uh, can provide some insight to our uh, many audience members about what, what happened. Um, and so that's, that's I think, the, the question that Bao Bao posed to us is why did this insurrection happen? Um, and I'm coming at this from a slightly different perspective as um, I don't study American politics, but rather um, political violence and conflict more broadly at the international level and at the comparative politics level. So, so I bring in insight from research on why political violence happens in other countries. And, um, and, and there's no reason actually to think that the US is any different from any other country that has experienced uh, political violence or conflict. Um, this, there's a notion um, of American exceptionalism that I think gets, that's played around in the media and among policymakers, which is a myth. Um, anything, any kind of political violence that you see in any other country is, is possible here as well. And, and I think last week was definitely demonstrated that. Um, 
so just drawing from that literature, there are three kind of three reasons um, or three uh, explanations uh, that kind of help us understand the kind of political violence that we saw last week. Um, and that those three are number one, motivation, number two, the ability to be able to recruit uh, and mobilize, and number three, an opportunity for the violence to occur. Um, so I'll start with the motivation. And I think that Nathan did a really nice job of unpacking the, the historical grievance, in quotes, grievance, um, which is, you know, this, this perception that um, whites in this country are losing ground or losing power. Um, and that that is the fundamental grievance um, that, that many people last week held, right? Now, whether it's a, obviously unsubstantiated grievance, but that's that's the feeling. And this goes back in time from the Civil War onwards. Um, I think the closest actually um, example of this kind of the violence that we saw um, to the same extent was the Wilmington insurrection in 1898, um, where in the city of Wilmington, um, organized groups, uh, much more organized, I think, I, I'm actually not a historian, I might be wrong about that, but and, and we don't know actually the extent to which there was organization last week, um, basically took over the government uh, because there were a number of black elected officials uh, in the city, at the city level that had been elected and uh, and they, they didn't want them to have power. So they they told them to get on a train and leave or uh, or they would kill them. Um, and so that's what happened in 1898. And unfortunately, I don't think that's an incident that's taught much in our in high schools. And so I would encourage students out there to go to look into this incident because it, it really does provide a nice example um, if you're looking for other examples in history. And I'll put in a, a link in the chat um, the other two, uh, you know, issues related to political violence why we see um, and the explanation is recruitment. And I'm sure um, my colleague Brendan will get into fake news and misinformation, but it's not just enough to have kind of elites that are mode that have this grievance. They need foot soldiers, they need people. And so um, using misinformation and fake news and lies, especially with the election, which, you know, was a, a trigger point in terms of being able to catalyze lies, um, uh, galvanized a large group of people to, to, to hold these views and to transition from, you know, being somewhat moderate, perhaps, you know, I, I know people that voted for Barack Obama in 2008 uh, that, that, that believed these lies um, about the election in 2020. So um, what didn't happen is the elites in the Republican Party have not stood up to this mis misinformation. And so um, it's given full reign for, for groups to mobilize. The last um, explanation for political violence is opportunity. And this I'll get into, I think, when I talk more about policing. Um, I think there's a question that Baba will ask me about policing, um, which is the fact that the, that the insurrectionists were not deterred. Um, their literature on political violence clearly states and finds that the strength of the state is correlated to preventing violence. And we know that the US has, is a very strong state if we think about law enforcement um, and militarization. Um, and so the big question is, why did, why did that fail? And I, I will get into that uh, as we move on. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kinane. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Bao Bao, for organizing this. Um, as uh, the esteemed panelists have all brought uh, different perspectives and offered a different viewpoint as to how it is that we got to the events of last Wednesday. Um, thinking through uh, historically, thinking through identity, thinking through, as Professor Krim just talked about, about uh, the various opportunities and motivations. Um, I, I will leave those kinds of conversations to our esteemed uh, panelists, but I will, I will instead think through um, or at least offer a little bit of insight into institutionally what role the institutions uh, that operate at our federal level of government have to play in this uh, in this in the developments uh, that we witnessed and 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 there are two really important ones and of course uh, there's the executive branch uh, which you know led by a president uh, who is offering disinformation and lies um, in in a, in a really um, norm busting way uh, typically uh, presidents have offered a variety of spin uh, no no president has been um, exactly truthful uh, but but there is at least some heart uh, to take with regard to results of elections uh, presidents in the past um, have, have largely accepted uh, defeat if if necessary of either their party or of themselves 
And uh, here we had not only a chief executive who was uh, really angst uh, written leading up to the election, uh, creating kind of this idea that the election itself uh, would not be uh, administered correctly or, or would potentially be administered with considerable numbers of uh, considerable level of fraud, but then after the fact was not challenged by the second branch, by Congress. Uh, Congress really, and, and members of Congress really did fail uh, and fail the American people and particularly of both parties, uh, just members of Congress writ large. And, and I hearken back to uh, what James Madison wrote uh, in Federalist 51, that ambition must be made to counteract ambition and that it, the interest of the man must be connected to the constitutional rights of the place. And what Madison meant was that the idea of separation of powers and the way that we constructed our institutional framework was meant to pit the Congress against the executive branch so as to keep these types of ambitions at least at bay enough and that the members of Congress would be beholden to their institution and that they would be protective of their institution. And what we saw was that they did not engage in those kinds of protections. And, and so we had this failing uh, with regard to responding to the executive. We had a failing with regard to the executive uh, treating the office uh, in a way that is, that is uh, held up with integrity and understanding that in fact, our institutions at the lower levels, the, the state level, and the way that they administered the election was not wrought with fraud. It was it was rather well in, uh, <laughs> established by by national security advisors and by members of the of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and 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 across the board of all of the various investigations of states that that their elections were run legitimately. And so we had this institutional failing uh, that kind of brought uh, perhaps what Professor Krim was talking about, this opportunity, this, 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 I, this availability for something like last Wednesday's uh, really dramatic violence to, to, to unfold. Thank you. Professor Nyhan. Uh, thanks. Thank you for organizing. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, what I want to do is actually um, pull back a little bit from the ways that my uh, co-panelists have talked about how we can understand the events that led up to the Capitol riot and remind us to be shocked and surprised about what happened. This was not an inevitability, even though you know, you've know you heard from the panel about the echoes of the past and what happened. This was not something that experts perceived as being likely to happen only a few years ago. Um, it was in 2012 that Mitt Romney was a Republican nominee for president. Afterwards, the Republican party said they need to expand their appeal to non-white voters. Um, that's certainly not the kind of candidate who would have challenged a peaceful transfer of power. There's been a substantial, uh, what's called democratic erosion in this country. Um, experts, um, both the ones that we've uh, surveyed at a group I'm part of called Brightline Watch and other experts uh, have all found declines in perceptions of democratic quality in the United States. So um, regardless of our terrible history, right, there really has been a decline Okay, and so what I would encourage people to think about is, um, you know, the U.S. does have a record of, um, you know, stability of government of this particular form of constitutional government for a long time, but it it has only been a full fledged democracy since the civil rights movement in the mid 1960s. Since that time, experts perceive U.S. democracy to have been of relatively high quality by international standards, and they, in our, in our at least retrospectively, in our surveys, they perceive roughly stable democratic quality from the 1970s to about 2015 and then they start we see this decline in u.s democracy so um obviously that's linked to the rise of donald trump and i just want to underscore that we can both understand the ways in which he came to power and we came to this point without treating it as a kind of inevitability and that's a tension that we have to to struggle with um the point that i would make in the time that we have left the time that I have left is just simply that um, I want to also think I also want to encourage us to take a step back from focusing on the violent insurrection itself as awful as it is. And to think about it as part of the larger challenge to the peaceful transfer of power, which in its way is an even greater threat to democratic stability in the long term. Small handfuls of people engaging in political violence is terrible. What's happening now is terrible. Members of Congress fear for their lives. That is unacceptable. But it should also scare us that more than half of the Republicans in Congress voted to reject 
the outcome of the election and essentially have rejected the process of the peaceful transfer of power. Um, that's a long-term threat to democratic stability in this country and one we have to think carefully about how to address moving forward. Thank you. And finally, Professor Richardson. Hi, thank you, Val Val, for organizing us. This is already such an interesting conversation. And what I'll offer and bring to it is a perspective of what African American witnesses have been trying to tell us for nearly 200 years now. Um, in my book, Bearing Witness While Black, I talk about these three overlapping eras of domestic terror against African Americans that started with slavery and morphed and gave way after the reconstruction to lynching as a way to enhance um, and also keep the order, the social order that was in place. And then that morphed to police brutality, which then went hand in hand with the mass incarceration uh, movement that we saw and grow so rapidly from the 70s, pretty much through the early 2000s. What I think we should be most afraid of, however, is that in what I just said, there is a definite morphing and changing, a mutation, if you will, an adaptation of how white supremacy um, takes hold and maintains itself. We are um, in a pandemic. We're very afraid of this virus that we can't see. And the news right now is that it is changing and that it is something that we are not able to anticipate. Therefore, we can't vaccinate against it, right? And I want us to resist that kind of thinking in this conversation that we're up against a virus, yes. We're up against a disease, yes. It does keep shape-shifting. It does keep changing to stay alive, but we have to be one step ahead of it. And I worry that this latest um, iteration of white supremacy and the violence that is needed to support it are signaling what a new way forward for white supremacy may look like. I also wanna to add to the conversation that we should also be very aware that every time that African-Americans make great strides to use the media at their disposal to let sympathetic whites know what is happening and sympathetic whites then join forces, that's when white supremacy gets even more vehement. There have been times throughout history from the slave narratives on with William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass working together to Martin Luther King since we're coming up on King Day all of his allies who were white working together then were threatened because that coalition is a formidable one and a frightening one to white supremacists that of the moderate white as well as the black um, activist that's been trying to plead his or her cause for a very long time. So as we begin to see more multiculturalism, and as we saw last summer, scores of people in the streets from all walks of life, we should be heartened that we did come together and that we were challenging and asking very difficult questions about where we want to go as a country. But as a reaction, this virus that continues to want to thrive has to change, it has to change shape. And so we have to be very afraid of and aware of the fact that um, once we stamp out police brutality, for example, there will be something else in that vacuum. And I'm hoping to unpack what that looks like. Thank you so much. Great insights from all of the panelists. Now we're going to move to the next section where I will uh, throw out some questions and we'll have a discussion for about half an hour. Uh, if you think of something and you wanna ask the panelists, please feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom and we will get to some of your questions, not all of them, unfortunately, we have limited time. Um, let's get started. So in terms of the first question, I want to talk about policing. There have been a lot of calls to beef up law enforcement uh, against these uh, right-wing extremists uh, or right-wing uh, domestic terrorists, as, uh, as some have called it. But how can we trust law enforcement with this task when we've known that law enforcement in this country, many, many of them exhibit racism and, and some even endorse these far right views. I think a lot of reporters and academics and activists have pointed out that the Capitol Police did little to stop the people participating in this insurrection. On the other hand, last summer we saw law enforcement, the National Guard uh, cracking down on Black Lives Matter uh, protesters with excessive violence. So how do we think about policing at this particular time? I know Sabrina, you wanted to 
say something you mentioned in your um, in your introduction. And panelists, if you want to chime in, please use the raise hand button, and I, I will call on you. Um, great. If, if if that's okay, I can I can go ahead and take this uh, question. Um, so I, let me just start out by saying that there is uh, an. Um, a need to kind of distinguish between different law enforcement agencies in the US because we have a pretty complicated system in terms of how law enforcement works. Uh, so the US Capitol Police were the police that were responsible for policing the, the, um, the actual Capitol building and the people inside. And the US Capitol Police are overseen by Congress. Now that's different from other law enforcement agencies in Washington DC. I should mention that there's about 33 law enforcement agencies that operate in the city of Washington, DC. And most of them are uh, you know, under the authority of the executive branch, which is Donald Trump, basically, the, the president. Um, and, and those are federal agencies like the FBI police or immigration and customs uh, enforcement agents, federal prison guards, et cetera. And those were the federal agents that the president called out in July to come into the streets to enforce the Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, it was in, it was by executive order to 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 bring out these um, federal agents in addition to the National Guard. So the National Guard was also called by by President Trump in the summer. Now, what happens at, at, at any time that there's kind of a, a, any kind of protest that it is on the property of the U.S. Capitol or on the on the Park Service? Is there's incidentally also a Park Service uh, agency that's a federal law enforcement. Uh, agency as well, um, is that the U.S. Capitol Police have to request that these other federal uh, agencies and or the National Guard come to help them and uh, provide backup. Now, there's been a lot of finger pointing in terms of who failed in that in requesting that, um, you know, all, all of the leadership of the U.S. Capitol Police and, and those that oversee them have kind of resigned. Um, they, you know, they say that they requested and that the federal agencies didn't respond to sort of, that's, that's not the argument here. There can be finger pointing all day long. What is clear is that leadership failed to foresee that this was going to be a threat. And that is by no means a issue of capacity. It is an issue of willpower. Um, you know, there, we, we all know that there's been increased uh, security since, especially since 9-11 with increased surveillance technology, the militarization of policing, and obviously, like Bao Bao mentioned, other protests event, events, not just the Black Lives Matter, but the Brett Kavanaugh protests and healthcare protests demonstrate that the US Capitol Police and other federal law enforcement agents are more than capable of, uh, of um, deterring slash, uh, you know, using force in these instances. That did not happen here. And that is, and, and I've been making this argument that one of the reasons for that is potentially something that I call strategic restraint by police leadership um, and also by the rank and file. Now, we know that there are reports that police leadership at, at whatever level you want, the federal agencies um, at, at, as well as National Guard or in the US Capitol Police, all of them, you know, mentioned that they did not want to be seen in a negative light like they were after the events of the summer. So they got a lot of negative publicity from what happened over the summer and they did not want a repeat of that. Now, that's fine, um, but there's also a second reason. And I think the second reason is, is all equally, if not more important, which is that uh, the political ideology of this particular you know, riot uh, or political violence more closely aligns with that of police officers than any of the other kind of protests that I mentioned, the, the Black Lives Matters, you know, Brett Kavanaugh uh, protests, et cetera. Now, when you have political alignment in ideology as well, you know, in, in particular, uh, the Blue Lives Matter movement, um, counter movement rather, uh, that similarity in political ideology means that these are people that are your friends. So it's really hard to see people that are your friends as a threat, or at least, you know, if not a threat, but that, that they would actually commit political violence against you. Um, and so we saw that potentially at the leadership level, we saw that on video at the rank and file level, uh, where you saw videos of people engaging in selfies, opening barriers, etc. cetera. Um, and so, you know, and that kind of behavior at the rank and file level just means that there's a lack of accountability within the, the law enforcement agencies where leadership is not holding accountable those who hold white supremacist views within police departments. Um, I have some thoughts about what should be done, but I'll leave it there in case any other panelists want to want to chime in. Thank you. Uh, Professor Richardson, I think you also raised your hand and 
wanted to contribute. Yes, and again, as a media scholar, I think of things in terms of images and what images are designed to do. And so one way of communicating, as we all know, is verbally. We can be, become demagogues and scream from the loudest, you know, hilltops on our soapboxes about what we think, but far more menacing in the 21st century is creating that ideal iconic image. And that's what was done last week when police decided that they were not going to punish um, the protesters in the way that they did the Black Lives Matter activists last summer, it sent a very clear image, a very clear picture that um, white supremacist violence will not be punished in this country. And by doing that, again, if we think about that partnership between moderate whites who may have been very interested and supportive of Black Lives Matter, it then sends a chill down the spine of those who would have supported African American Americans and people of color broadly in their fights for equality and enfranchisement. The fact that this was also held on a day that was designed to eclipse the major win in Georgia um, is something that doesn't, that's not lost on me either. And when I think about the, the mighty organizing that was done by African American activists in the past who have also done this, who have also staged huge sit ins and demonstrations around the time of evening news broadcasts, I think about how intentional that imagery was again with police not doing anything. Again, they may say we were criticized roundly, for example, for cracking the skull of a man in New York or any number of the people who were blinded this summer from um, assault rifles and other kinds of, of flashbangs and, and, and other things that police used this summer. Huge spreads in the Washington Post about that specifically. So I understand that that is going to be one excuse that is used for why that restraint wasn't rolled out. But the elephant in the room is there's a stark difference between peaceful Black protesters going out mourning a loved one and white insurrectionists who were met with almost no resistance. And that picture, that imagery is the same imagery that you would see in a lynching photograph when you would see a white officer, police officer with a badge, not even in sheets most of the time as a member of the Klan, but with a badge sanctioning that hanging or sanctioning that beating or burning in the same way. And so I juxtapose those images. I can't separate them or divorce them in my mind because I know that the origins of policing did begin as slave catching and again, morphed into policing uh, black bodies throughout the South and as they migrated North throughout points North. And now they continue to police uh, African-Americans, especially when protesting. And now what we're seeing though, is that that treatment has been perfected. And because it's been perfected on us, it is now spreading to other groups. And I think that's what should alarm us most is that these aren't just treatments of African-Americans anymore. Everyday Americans who oppose this party that wants to stay in power will meet this end. And so these images are used to create fear. They're used to create a sense of this is what the status quo is and this is what is valued. And we have to be very uh, careful about how we evaluate those images or dismiss them as just a few folks on the fringe. Because as we've seen with the rise of this Tea Party that they were never fringe. They just didn't have the images to go along with their, their actions splashed across mainstream media. Thank you. Professor Kronbach, you, you have, uh, you also wanted to contribute. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I, I definitely agree with Professor Kareem, Professor Richardson's takes, and I'd like to sort of branch out from Professor Richardson's uh, take into policing in the US more generally outside of this particular incident. And I think this is a way to maybe bring I'll uh, introduce a little bit of daylight. I agree so much with so many of our, the, the, everything our panelists have said, but this might generate a bit of space between us. And that is, I think the issue of policing, particularly since the 1970s and the lack of attention that social scientists gave to it in the US actually was a bias in perceptions of American democracy and democratic health. So the lack of uh, sort of uh, footage, for example, camera footage of police brutality against black Americans, for example, led to a neglect of that issue area and an overestimation of the quality of American democracy, especially for black Americans. So uh, Joe Sauce and Vessel Weaver, of course, talk about the deeply authoritarian presence of policing in race and class subjugated communities. So when we think about this, this sort of, uh, it leads me to sort of push back on a couple of things, one that, uh, sort of real democratic backsliding happened after 2015, um, where 
there was tremendous uh, democratic backsliding in the form of further authoritarian and militarized policing and the ramping up of it since the 1970s and especially the 1990s. Uh, the second thing is it challenges our belief in American federalism in decentralized institutional structures. Policing is done tremendously at the state and local level. About 95% of prisoners are in state and local jails. This is not something where, ah, all politics is local. Let's devolve authority to lower levels and bring constituents closer to their representatives. Those local state and local levels are actually the most captured by authoritarian and plutocratic forces and anti-democratic forces. That was the uh, states' rights, of course, was the call of Jim Crow and white supremacy institutionally for so long, and it uh, still remains so. Uh, uh, I'm sort of transitioning to what I think Bell Bell will get to next institutionally is that democratic backsliding was happening, I see in my, observe in my quantitative research and others, since the 2000s at the state level with the rise of voter suppression tactics, state governments administer elections, they ramped up voter suppression tactics, gerrymandering uh, in really extreme forms. And this was mostly, again, the Republican party that was at the time considered a more principled conservative party. But we really saw uh, the sort of origins of this democratic backsliding, enough of which may have actually generated the Trump victory in 2016. Right. So if districts, if uh, elections had been uh, uh, more open, free and fair in uh, the US, then the 2016 election may have gone another way and we wouldn't be here. So, uh, again, sort of a focus on policing and, that, and state and local politics tends to sort of challenge our notions of sort of the exceptional American democracy over the past generation. Thank you for your insight. Uh, Indeed, we're going to talk about political institutions next. To the panelists, what do you think are the actions that uh, the US Congress and the executive branch should take in the short term? Uh, should Donald Trump be immediately removed from office? What should also happen to members of Congress who contributed to the incitement of this insurrection or who supported this insurrection or supported Donald Trump's claims that the election was stolen? And beyond these short-term actions, what do you think are some long-term reforms that are needed to our political institutions to make sure this doesn't happen again? So if you want to raise your hands, I can call on you. Professor Kinane. So I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll jump in there. Uh, I think well, first of all, um, you know, there it, it, it has been a long week. A lot has happened as uh, you know, 2021 is following the the trend of 2020, despite the fact that we thought we could leave that in our in our rear view mirror, as it were. Each week is uh, is it could be an entire history book on its own. And so, uh, you know, since uh, Wednesday, we have seen that uh, the House has offered up articles of impeachment, have voted on it, and we did see that they passed the House. And so the question, uh, Baba, that you pose is, is one that, that um, you know, is, is in the process of being answered. And, and that is that the House has, in fact, deemed uh, the, the president's incitements of this insurrection to be uh, unlawful enough to require impeachment as, as, as most, uh, uh, experts would agree. And now it, it goes to the Senate. And the question then becomes is uh, what can be what can be accomplished? And knowing that Senate Leader McConnell is not going to call back the Senate uh, to engage in a trial, the likelihood of senators voting uh, to remove uh, President Trump from office within a day of, of his, uh, ex his term expiring is relatively low in probability. And so then the question really becomes what happens after uh, Trump's term is, uh, is concluded and President-elect Biden is sworn in and inaugurated next week? That is a question that I think we can have a discussion about. Um, it is one that has a variety of, of, of pros and cons, as it were, right? So the idea that you are hoping to uh, deter and, and keep this kind of behavior at bay to, to protect uh, our democracy for the future, you would want to pursue a full trial. Uh, you would want to pursue a full trial of the act of, of inciting an insurrection. Um, 
there are calls for unity on on the from the Republicans that that aim to kind of push past this. But the question then becomes, how unified can a country be if, in fact, a, a president uh, could run for office again after inciting an insurrection um, and, and having been impeached twice? That is, of course, problematic, but not necessary, but not disqualifying, right? It's not disqualifying from you from running for president again. And so I can open, you know, there are, I'm sure other people have have opinions as to um, uh, what should happen moving forward. And I'd like to, I, I would want to discuss that, but I'd also want to kind of leave the, the conversation with a question because we have moved a week and so much has happened to what can happen in the future and more long-term, that question, Bao Bao, that you offered in terms of what should be done for members of Congress. Um, that is that is in, incredibly problematic, uh, uh, mostly because you cannot have members of Congress sharing uh, lies about uh, elections. This is uh, this will destabilize our trust uh, and 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 our uh, the the citizens' ability to believe the results of election, which is one of the fundamental tenets of a democracy. And in doing so, they actually are causing self harm because they themselves are in fact elected officials and 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 opening that door uh, is is incredibly problematic so there needs to be some type of, of backlash to this there needs to be a way to create incentives for members to not engage in this behavior and how those incentives are created um, is is one that I, I you know we could we could discuss as, as a panel. Thank you. Professor Nyhan. Yeah, I think I think um, how we're going to change the political incentives is a critical question that we all face going forward. In terms of what should be done, um, I think you know I was one of the authors of an open letter calling for the president to be impeached or removed from office or removed under the Twenty Fifth Amendment, um, inciting a violent insurrection or rejecting the peaceful transfer of power. I think is about as clear a case as you could possibly have. Um, but the larger question, even if if President Trump is um, disqualified from holding office. This larger question of how um, we deal with anti-democratic tendencies in our politics is a critical one. Um, in part, this is going to be a fight that is fought within the Republican Party, um, and that means it's not a it's not one that's easily amenable to solutions. At the same time, we we have seen in the last few in the last few weeks where the fissures are in the Republican Party. Up to this point, never Trump Republicans had no leverage within the party. There was no discernible faction within the party. Everyone who opposed Trump was either keeping their head down or leaving uh, the national political scene entirely. Now we've seen people who are willing to draw the line. We've seen people within the party who have found some ground they're willing to fight on. And that is an important development. Um, the question is how successful they'll be. And I guess what I think as political scientists, especially we can contribute to is a conversation about how to create institutional rules and processes that create political incentives for those folks who want to change the Republican Party to win because they will need those votes that they can appeal to with a broader, more inclusive approach. Um, and you know, um, I've been persuaded by Lee Drutman, for instance, at the New America Foundation that um, moving towards uh, a more proportional system um, that would create more space uh, you know, for the Mitt Romneys of the world to not be beholden to the Republican Party um, could be a really powerful way to change incentives and to get out of the zero sum logic that has locked so many people in place on the Republican side, despite the anti-democratic actions we've seen over the last four years. That's a longer term kind of project. Um, in the short term, we also have to protect the right to vote for every American and think about the minoritarian aspects of our system, which also create perverse incentives. They reduce essentially the penalty for extremism that um, Christina is, is pointing to and that we need to, um, you know, address if we want to encourage these other Republicans to successfully win control of that party or change the party system. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kelmwell? Yeah, on the like question of, yeah, on the, on the question of extremism, um, Leadership is incredibly important. So the, everything that we can do to encourage a, a more moderate set of leaders is going to, to help because 
ordinary people often struggle to make sense of politics without turning to leaders who they trust. And they need to have cues that are upholding democracy rather than tearing it down. Um, I, I also wanted to add one other thing about the, the potential ways that, that members of Congress who might be complicit could, could be um, held accountable. One of the big challenges is that many of them have voters who are going to reelect them pretty much regardless of what they do or maybe even reward them for what they're doing. The Congress itself still has some opportunities to hold them accountable. However, they can pass uh, a censure, which is essentially a criticism. They can strip them of committee assignments and, and make it harder for them to uh, accomplish their goals. The Silver Era has another president, which is the Congress has the power to expel members of Congress or to not accept them back in when they are um, presented uh, with the election results. So that's uh, not likely to happen in this case, but in under extreme circumstances, Congress can actually kick its members out for, for things like inciting insurrection. Thank you, Professor Kareem. Thanks. I, I just want to uh, um, chime in here about um, institutions as they relate to policing, since Jake brought up the excellent point, uh, sorry, Professor Grumbach <laughs> brought up the excellent point about, um, about how policing is inextricably linked to our democracy. Um, so when we're talking about institutional changes, there needs to be institutional changes within policing as well. And that starts with holding accountable all those police officers who attended the, the, the protests and, and protests with the rioting who entered the Capitol building. But also, uh, you know, there are there are so many reports out there that show that there are police officers that hold white supremacist views. And, you know, this is linked to the history that Professor Richardson mentioned about um, policing being, you know, historically linked to slave patrols, etc. But but it, it is it, it is quite um, shocking. I think um, to think about the fact that there are, you know, people that hold these views that are that are that are operating as law enforcement agents, and so there needs to be a purging. Um, and I would actually argue, going a step further, that once you purge these people from police departments all over the country and, and hopefully federal agencies, they're just going to be recruited by these groups, and so. Uh, you know, they need to be also put on watch lists to, to, to you know, in, in terms of um, accountability as well, because you can't, it's, it's just, it, it's not enough to just fire them from, from the law enforcement agencies, but these are, these are actually potential recruits um, into these white supremacist groups that, that could then become violent um, against the government. Um, so I would just add that we should be thinking about institutional constraints politically, but also within the security sector as well. Thank you. We have one more question before we move to uh, Q and A with from the audience. And this question is: What can ordinary people like you and me do at this time to make sure that what happened on January sixth, and frankly, other threats to democracy, doesn't happen? What can we, who are not politicians, do? Uh, Professor Kumbach. Thanks. Um, so there are many things to do. So everybody knows you've heard the calls to vote this cycle around, including in midterm elections and down ballot races and so forth. Absolutely critical voting in primaries as well. Um, but in addition, there are social movements to participate in, Black Lives Matter, other sort of pro-democracy movements. But beyond that, we in civil society, we actually have tremendous power you know, collectively to make it more costly or less costly for elites and their sort of affiliated base to take sort of anti-democratic or fascist or white supremacist actions. So you see now, for example, a lot of firms are, are announcing they're no longer giving PAC contributions to Republicans who voted against uh, 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 certifying the election results, right? Um, so that's something one can do. Uh, uh, if they're in a firm to pressure their firm to not only, I, I think this could go a step further. So as we talked about the, you know, the origins of the Republican and Republican aligned sort of anti-democratic push over the past really generation or at least past sort of two decades or so, um, you can really pressure your firm, religious or, uh, institutions that you participate in, uh, your universities and schools and so forth to really uh, try to exclude, fully socially exclude participants in 
like neo-fascist, white supremacist and anti-democratic movements. It can become very costly. I know it sounds like cancel culture, but cancel culture is actually is how politics works. Uh, there are social costs to doing things that society doesn't quite like. You might not get a date with your with like the super hottie if you do something fascist. So uh, consider that. And there are all types of forms of social pressure that you can engage in peacefully, especially if you're a member of an organization like a business or a religious group. Thank you. Professor Kelmo. Yeah, I wanted to emphasize um, social influence, the conversations that we have with people, uh, our friends, our family. It's a huge influence on political attitudes and actions uh, across all kinds of public opinion and political action. So the most important thing that I think regular people can do in this case is for you to knock down the false and dangerous myths about the election and reinforce that Joe Biden was fairly elected president. Um, in a survey that Lily, and, uh, Lily Mason and I did uh, in November, we found that Republicans who falsely believe that Democrats cheated in the election are twice as likely to say they support violent resistance against Biden's inauguration by a military coup, by state national guard resistance, and by armed ordinary citizens. And so it's really important for people to have conversations with their friends and family to reduce the extreme support for those kinds of things and potentially even reduce their participation in those actions. And I'll Thank just you. add to that. One of the things I think we can do most is also hold accountable the people that you may have elected. So if you did vote for someone who won this year, make sure that you don't just breathe a sigh of relief. I think that one of the things, again, that I think about most um, dealing with images is how Oscar Grant died on a platform just days before President Barack Obama took his oath. So we were so busy celebrating this momentous occasion as we should have been, but those were the early seeds of us, you know, really trying to clamp down on police brutality and film it. He, his was the first filmed account of police brutality with a cell phone with this huge gap after Rodney King. So I think that a lot of times we think, well, how could this have happened? Why do these mo moments just seem to bloom out of nowhere? They really don't. They happen when we're distracted or patting ourselves on the back. So to the people that you voted for, still hold them accountable, still say, now that you're in office, we expect this. And if they don't do it, don't vote for them again. Uh, Professor Kareem had her hand up. So I'm gonna go to you. Great, and then I think Professor Kinane also, but uh, do you wanna go first or? Okay, okay, I'll, um, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I just, I think would add just two things. So, you know, if, if we're talking about policing, um, it's all so decentralized and everything happens at the local level, it's very easy to get involved in local politics. And that's where I would tell, um, especially young people that, you know, it's, it's important obviously to track presidential races and congressional races and Senate races, but really your life is being affected by what happens at the local level. And so look at who's running, you know, when is the next city elections for city council, for the mayor, for um, state boards of education or, or boards of education um, and, and get involved. You know, I'm sure that uh, those are the campaigns that need the most amount of volunteers um, because they have less money. So, and those are, those are the, the people that really control what happens with respect to policing in your city and within your county and within your state. And so if you want to put pressure to have to see change um, with respect to policing, it happens at that local level. And it's it's very easy to get involved. Um, I'm sure any political leader at the local level would welcome your help on campaigns. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is that I think we have a lot to learn from the example, um, the, 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 you know, what I'll say is the positive news from last week, which was what happened in Georgia. Um, not just because, uh, you know, the Democrats won, but rather just seeing the extent to which uh, local community organizing, especially by Black women, happened. And we can really, I think, take a lesson from the kinds of activities of how you can get involved in your community and what to do to, 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 to uphold our democracy by what African American women and, and people of color have been doing for, for ages, which has really been kind of using strategies and tactics at the local level to make sure that our democracy stays alive. Thank you, Professor Kinane, and then we will go to Q&A from the audience. 
Well, if I had gone first, I would have said something very similar. So thank you, Professor Grimm. I was uh, I was very literally going to say to get involved in your local politics. So I will echo that. I will not repeat it uh, uh, as eloquently as you did. However, I will also say um, uh, to the point, uh, the question, you know, kind of that that Professor Kamo brought up um, of of speaking with uh, with individuals and and particularly those in your social circle and. To that point, the fact that uh, talking politics became so taboo uh, for you know for a long period of time, you didn't want to upset anyone, and in doing so, you it really allows things to fester. And and the way that Professor Richardson described it as a virus, I think, is is so perfect for our COVID world, where we are witnessing that so much of the spread of COVID is happening in living rooms. Well, so does other things, and and so it really is not about. And I study national and institutions. I, I implore everyone to call your congressman, call your senator, be an active citizen uh, in, in national elections uh, for those, those officers at the federal level because they are passing laws. But, but you know, Pro uh, Professor Krim was absolutely correct that the ones that impact you most are at the local level and at your state level. And the state level elections, hearkening back to what uh, Professor Grumbach talked about, those are the ones who are drawing districts they are redistricting and they're redistricting after a senate literally right now they are going to be determining the way in which our national politics are decided and and it's so kind of counterintuitive that you you need to be involved in the local level in order to influence the national level but that is what it is and so um you know people under 18 might not be able to vote yet but you can do a whole lot more there's so much that you can do uh, to get involved and to really start changing the tide. This is not at all something that's a that that is a that is a drippy faucet that can't be fixed. So, thank you. So now we're moving to Q and A from the audience. We have about uh, fifteen minutes, and I think this is a really interesting question. Thank you, everyone who are watching internationally. It's very late at night, I'm sure. Uh, this comes from someone in the uh, so someone who's teaching American politics in the UK. And they said, I've been str struck by how shocked and concerned my students have been seeing some of these political institutions being so vulnerable. I was wondering what images do you think this portrays uh, of the US around the world? So uh, speaking from an international perspective, what does this mean for uh, the portrayal of the US around the world? Professor Richardson? Yes, I can speak to that. I think that the images, again, speak volumes around the world to what we, what we internalize as American exceptionalism exceptionalism, but other countries do not necessarily. I've heard from many of my colleagues abroad in different journalism schools around the world that this was an expected end to our election cycle. And I was very surprised by that. I kind of subscribed to this whole idea that this would not happen here and that other people would be appalled by this kind of thing. But when I spoke to other scholars, they said the same things have happened in our country. Did anyone witness the Arab Spring at all? I don't understand how you all thought this would not touch your shores. So I think we have to be very careful when we have these kinds of discussions to not uh, buy into that idea that this couldn't have happened here. We're very vulnerable to these same things. And I think even seeing the occupation, I will call it, of our military inside the capital to try to protect it looks a lot like a lot of foreign countries that I've monitored when my brother was abroad fighting the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, the pictures that he would send home of him camped out with his backpack as a pillow. I was really surprised uh, by and saddened by to see that our own capital looks that way. So yes, abroad, we do look very, very bad right now. And it looks like our democracy is eroding. And so I think swift action is so important to show people that we all do care about preserving our right, not only to vote, but to have that peaceful transfer of power in place and images matter. Thank you. Um, does another panelist, uh, Professor Kareem? Uh, I'll just chime in really quickly that, you know, uh, the US is one of the, has 
you know, one of the strongest programs in terms of democracy promotion around the world. So a lot of what the State Department and USAID do is uh, put funding into helping other countries transition into democracy. And so if that is, is if democracy at home is failing, then it sets a really bad example for the success of those kinds of programs abroad. So the ramifications from last week and really, you know, of the last four years and, and you know, we can, we can debate where the starting point is, um, is really not just domestically, but internationally as well. Thank you, Professor Knain. I, I um, this, this, this is it, it really important uh, what both um, uh, you know, Professor Kern and Professor Richardson offered, but I would like to just put a, uh, I would like to just take one slight positive aspect and that is that turnout was at a record level uh, that we have not seen in a hundred years. And so there is reason to believe that, uh, you know, the things that we observed in Georgia, the fact that you can have uh, uh, voter registration drives that are not only successful, but wildly successful to bring first time voters in who are well over the age of 25, who are voting for the first time and engaging in the democratic process for the first time in a decades, many decades long life, that, that this is uh, this is this is a positive thing to 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 look at and to hopefully not lose sight of the fact that we have uh, seen progress made in a lot of ways uh, uh, in a lot of really important places um, that have have brought people into the process and and have really engaged them in a way that we hadn't seen uh, uh, and so I think that that yes it is 100% the case that witnessing uh, uh, from abroad uh, uh, the U.S. Capitol just dominated by national, um, uh, by, by troops that are, you know, there to send a signal, right? The, the signal that they're sending is a strategic one, right? It's to say, this is no longer an undefended place. Do not attempt violent action as you will not be met with a Capitol Police resist, you know, bare resistance, but rather with the National Guard fully stocked. Um, that is a that is a strategic signal, but also you know I, I would want to 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 emphasize that we did have a historic turnout in a presidential election. Um, that that if we could keep that trend going, then that would actually be quite positive for our democracy. Thank you. So. I'm going to move on to the next question, which I'm going to roll one of my own questions into it because I think that's there's like an elephant in the room that we haven't addressed. And that's the role of misinformation. Um, how can we fight the desensitization, uh, desensitization of misinformation? This uh, person had commented that they have seen a lot of their peers they don't seem to care about politicians telling lies on the internet. So how can we educate our friends, our peers, our loved ones, our family? And part of that, I think one thing that we hadn't talked about is the role of tech companies. Um, so the, the big social network platforms have finally banned uh, Donald Trump and far right extremists. Do you think that's a good move in terms of cutting off the spread of misinformation um, and should have, they have done it earlier. I think many of us who are sort of in internet studies and internet uh, policy have raised the alarm many years ago. So in general, this question is about misinformation and perhaps the role of the internet and social media companies. So uh, panelists, if you wanna speak to that. Professor Nyhan, I know you have a lot to say. Well, um, that's that's a question we could have a whole separate uh, seminar about. I guess I would say um, I, I, I want to encourage people to um, challenge, I want to challenge kind of two assumptions that often come up in this debate. The first is that tech companies can actually solve the misinformation problem. Um, first of all, um, they can't. Uh, uh, already we're seeing it moving to different kinds of spaces, encrypted apps and so forth. This is not something that um, can be magically solved from on high, especially given the volume of content that's out there. Um, second, I'm not sure that we would actually want them to in a democratic society. Do you want to delegate that much power over political speech 
to a few executives at private companies. Um, it's not a First Amendment issue per se, but they're essentially regulating the public square on our behalf. I'm not sure. I think we should be careful what we ask for in demanding that uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Jack, whatever his name is at Twitter, suddenly get to decide who gets access to the public square. Um, that, that is a, a fraught sort of question. I think we should be really careful about it. Um, I think people can do better at encouraging, uh, discouraging misinformation um, in their uh, social world. We've talked a lot about let me just emphasize that it has that has to be done respectfully, and it's going to be most effective with people like you. Right? So if you if you think the misinformation problem is everyone on the other side, that's not really a social influence thing because you're not going to be an especially effective messenger to them. But you can be an especially effective messenger to your friends and family, the people who trust. You. And you can be especially effective at um, discouraging the use of misinformation in politics from people on your own side. And hopefully, we can draw those norms more sharply. Um, and discourage politicians from promoting misinformation because I do think that supply side is easier. There's no, it, you know, we can try to improve media and things like that, but we're going to change human psychology. As humans, we're vulnerable to misinformation. And, um, you know, I think a lot of the action here is on the supply side, the politicians who are, who are promoting it and circulating it. Um, and so we need to think about how to strengthen the political disincentives from engaging in those kinds of tactics. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to chime in? Professor Kelmo? Yeah, I think we haven't disagreed enough, so I'll, I'll add a little bit of disagreement. Um, I think, or at least a, a different direction uh, with uh, Professor Nyhan. Uh, part of the, the problem here in framing it as um, a few executives controlling the speech going on in the, the public sphere is that there's only a couple of companies that are effectively the public sphere. Um, if there were dozens of, of outlets, it would be uh, a different story. So part of the, the issue here is the bigger issue of monopolization of, of, um, of that social media environment. Professor Kinney. I could also add just a, um, I think that, uh, I think that, that certainly there is cause for concern in thinking through uh, asking tech companies to self-regulate. Um, but I think that it's important to remember that this is not something that has been wildly uh, uh, available for us to draw from historically. Uh, the, you know, the, the kind of town square uh, standing on your soapbox, you would reach 10, 20, maybe 100 people. Uh, and in order to reach larger audiences, you needed to have a national outlet. You needed to engage in, uh, you know, some type of, of television or radio, which are regulated. And, and you needed to have that, that uh, you know, that, that bring in from those national uh, uh, suppliers of information. And with social media being uh, rather laissez-faire in doing so has created a space that's not regulated but reaches so many people in a way that we haven't been able to kind of grapple with. And the fact that the information is not necessarily coming from from humans, right? That that the transmission of information is not even from uh, someone who is is accurately representing themselves. Oftentimes, the people who are spreading misinformation are not even in the United States. They are in Macedonia, or they are not even humans. They're algorithms and bots. And, and so thinking through what it means to regulate the public sphere is a lot more complicated than cutting people off because we don't actually know who those people are. We don't know where that information is coming from. And if they had to go to television or radio, they would be regulated. It. So we need to start having a conversation about what it means to actually regulate rather than requiring or, or relying on market forces to do it for us. Thank you. I'm going to move to the next question from the audience. And I just like to thank all the educators who are in the audience. Thank you so much for attending. We hope that what we uh, talked about will help you uh, in terms of your teaching this semester. And this educator asks, how do you plan on talking about these events in your courses this semester? I'm at a loss when educating students who identify with the perpetrators of the riot. Professor Richardson. You're muted. 
one of the things that I do because I teach at a predominantly white university is make sure that I ground this in fact so that they know it's not just coming from me from an emotional place because I am a woman of color, a black woman. And so what I plan to do with them is open up as I've done every other semester with an anonymous poll. And so I use poll everywhere. And so when I'm getting ready to talk about really meaty, potentially con controversial issues, what I'll do is take a, the temperature of the room. And so I may ask a question that's open-ended that they can text and no one will know it's them and say, why do you think, or what was the motivation behind many of the people who rioted last week? And then people can type in their concerns. And then from those concerns, say if the majority of the people, because I've designed it to look like a word cloud and the biggest word comes up is disenfranchisement or loss of country or, um, maybe even the opioid crisis, something like that. Then I know specifically which body of literature in, with which to engage to then teach them, this is how historically this has played out. This is why this cyclical kind of behavior is problematic. This is where it got us before. This is where it's probably gonna get us this time. And this is what you can do about it. And when I've really engaged with students that way, where they feel safe enough to put their angriest thoughts um, in a space that everyone else can see, of course, so it's still, semi-civil, um, but then they get the actual readings, films, or whatever references that would speak to that feeling, they feel a lot more empowered to then have an open conversation that doesn't rely on um, this anonymous poll. So by the end of the class, I get a little bit of meager hands. And then by the second class, everyone comes in with like, look, I read the Chomsky or look, I read the, I read the bell, bell hooks. This is what I think. Um, what do you think? And again, I try to play devil's advocate as much as possible. And then it's important also, I would say even before you do all of that to set the classroom norms as I'm sure you already do. So we don't have to agree all the time. In fact, none of my students do. They're all journalism students and they all think they would write the story the best way in a different way. Um, so I think that um, just keeping that space open so that everyone can learn together, make mistakes together, say the wrong thing in a safe spot um, is very important because a lot of students will clamp up or feel like they don't want to talk because they don't want to offend anyone and they don't want to get dragged in their parlance. They don't want to say something that makes them look like they're a racist when they have a genuine question about something they know nothing about because they don't have any friends of color or they come from a place that's very, very sheltered and they're trying to actively break away and learn. I found also, um, it's just as this last caveat, that if you're still teaching online, which I will be, um, we also have to keep in mind that some of the parents of our students may be very conservative, but our students may be leaning toward um, moderate, being a centrist or even being a leftist, and that may cause friction. So you should also create a space where they can talk to you privately about things, whether it's the same anonymous Google Doc or box somewhere where they can ask a question. Um, I think that's important too, because I had students last semester whose parents would not let them wear earbuds. They're like, I wanna hear what I'm paying for. And I wanna hear what that teacher has to say about this whole movement. And if I agree with it, I'm gonna jump in the screen and say something. And so that happened a couple of times to the student's chagrin. So I think we're just in a whole new world right now and keeping the space open so that people can be respectful, but then get the things that they need to off their chest is most important, especially um, if you don't look like your students or you, they think that you're on the other side. Thank you. This is a great, uh, thank you for all these suggestions. Uh, I think let's end on this note because we're at time, but before we go, uh, we want to have some food for thought, things that you can read and fo follow up on. So I asked each of the panelists to recommend one book or article that they I uh, think the members of the audience should read to understand what happened and how we can uh, process the event and respond to it. Professor Krumbach, do you want to start? Sure. It's not directly on this, but I just really like Jamila Michener's Fragmented Democracy, so I'll just say that. Oh, who, who, sorry, I, I lost the cue. Um, Professor Kelmo, do, do you want to chime in? Sure, yeah. Um, I particularly liked uh, Omar Owasso, political scientist, his essay last week in the Washington Post 
uh, called This Is Not Who We Are. Actually, the Capitol riot was quintessentially American. It's about the two Americas in conflict through history, not just one America, with egalitarianism and democracy against ethnic nationalism. Thank you. Professor Kareem. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I'll, I'll mention a book about policing. So I really like Stuart Schrader's Badges Without Borders, um, which really talks about how the history of militarized policing within the US and how it's intimately tied with counterinsurgency uh, by the US abroad. So I'll, put, I'll actually put it in the chat as well. Thank you. Professor Kinane. Uh, I really like um, Ashley Jardina's uh, White Identity Politics. I think um, it was, public, I, think, I think it came out last year, but I feel like I've, I've read uh, versions um, uh, leading up to that, but, uh, but it's, it's an excellent, excellent piece on, um, on, on really uh, white identity and, and, and racial conflict uh, in, that, in that regard. And so it, I think it, it helps a lot with this, uh, with the lead up to, to last week's instruction. Thank you. Professor Nyhan? I'll cheat and offer two very quickly. How Democracies Die, which is a great summary of what we know about how democratic erosion takes place in other countries, and Four Threats, which goes deep into the history of democratic erosion in the United States. If you pair those together, it's a perfect introduction to the threat that we face here. Thank you. And finally, Professor Richardson. Yes, I would recommend one of my favorite activists that I profiled in my book, Bearing Witness While Black, and her name is Eve Ewing. She is a scholar and a poet um, in the University of, of Chicago, and she wrote a very great piece for the Breonna Taylor uh, van edition of Vanity Fair, and it was called The Police Union, America's Brotherhood of Police Officers, and it does a great, um, it does a great job of explaining what the culture of policing is and how we might dismantle it, and if you want to read more about um, how people who are working in that space to understand how images function to reinforce some of these ideologies, then I invite you to check out my book as well. And I'll put links to both. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for putting the links to these articles and books in the chat. Panelists, I really appreciate your taking the time to talk to the members of the audience. And uh, if your students are busy and didn't get a chance to watch it live, I will upload this video to YouTube as soon as we're finished so that you can share it with your students. I'll tweet about it. And also the American Political Science Association's educational website has agreed to host the video and also uh, link to all these books and articles that you recommended. So thank you, everyone. Thanks and for organizing, Bella. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Come in, Bye. everybody.